So this is lecture 15 of ECE 2305. And so in today's lecture, we are going to talk about Ethernet and we're going to talk about switches. OK? So um, what we're going to look at in particular is the structure of the Ethernet. What does it mean to be Ethernet? So Ethernet and Internet are kind of two separate things. The Internet is a network that first was derived from ARPANET, which was a DARPA project where essentially you know, they were looking at resilient networks of connecting different computers together, and it's very difficult to sort of disable the entire network. Somehow, that information gets routed from point A to point B. And that's where we get today's internet from, right? So, but Ethernet is different. So Ethernet is how that information is handled from point A to point B, right? And we'll look at the structure. This is probably what you're setting up on your home computer, your iPhone, or smartphone, or whatever networking device you have. Switches, as we're going to look at, switches is one way of forwarding information. So you probably have at home, you might have a router, but for me, I'm quite aware I have a switch, right? So informa information hits the switch, and then it says, OK, embedded in that, that switch is there's going to be a forwarding table. And it says, oh, you got IP address so-and-so that you want to send this to? No problem. I'm going to send it on this port over to that guy, and he's going to get it. No problem. Really fast, right? There's a slight difference between that and, say, routing. Remember that? So routing, we saw a few lectures ago. Routing, what we did, remember we had the ARP, right? The Address Resolution Protocol, where we had a table of both MAC address and IP address, and we had all this fancy sort of stuff going on where it's like, OK, I have the IP address. I don't have the MAC address. Is B out there? Oh, no, 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 no. He's at that LAN over there. No problem. And then a router goes to router, it goes to server or whatever. Then you hit the LAN, the local area network of where B is located, and then you carry on that protocol. Hey, B, what's your MAC address? Oh, it's this com combination of hex digits. OK, we're all set. Commence forwarding of data, right? Switch is, oh, you want this IP address? You want this port here, this jack, that little plug thing that you plug into the back, right? And so we're going to look at an example of how that forwarding table works, right? It's like IP address that way, right? So let's, let's get started. So physical topology. So there are a number of ways, right, of networking devices together. So first of all, we have the bus topology, where all the nodes are in the same collision domain, right? So everyone's on the same single bus. And this kind of reminds me of the old days when I, ha when I was working, I forgot where it was, one of my internships. And I had a single coax cable, right? And then there's a T-joint. And then a part of that coax goes into the back of a computer and then keeps on going on. Oh, to the next computer, T-joint connects, T-joint. So how? Uh, OK, instead of hand waving, I have this bad habit, right? It's like I go to a store, like let's say Home Depot. Oh, oh I, I need a piece for my deck. It's about this big. And the guy's like, OK, what are the dimensions? You know? So yeah, I, I talk a lot with my hands. So let's, let's actually go to drawing. I do have the technology, OK? So bus topology. OK? So what is a bus topology? You have this guy here, right? And then you have a node, let's say A. You have a node, you have B. You have a node, C, D. And maybe you have other guys on either side. Now, what's interesting about this? So you have the same medium. If two guys transmit at once, you get a collision, right? So think about it. Let's, let's think about, like, if some of you have taken computer architecture, like your computer, right? Or, for instance, what also uses a bus? Hard disks or anything on like the IEC. I'm not sure if SATA does or not. But, but any one of those, like if you have a bus, you have a master that controls access to that bus, and you have multiple slaves. In this case, what would happen is all these guys are accessing the same medium, and there's the potential for collision. So you might have one of several architectures. You might have one guy that says, OK, let's say A is the master. Again, hand waving, so I better go to drawing. Master, and these guys 
are slaves. Slaves. I have to spell this now. So what that means is master says, in this case, okay, B is now your turn. So then B performs its operation. Let's say it transmits to D. Ah, I hate when that happens. And then it's like, okay, B, you're done. C, your turn. D, your turn. And so what ends up happening is, in this configuration, you have a common medium or channel okay, to perform all the communications on your network. So that is a bus topology, right? Single medium, all the traffic occurs over that bus. There is another one, and I, instead of going back to the slides, I'll just say it. There is the star topology. Woo, star. So the star topology is not only used in networks, yes. So A, what A does is, um, so by definition, the, the master sort of sets sort of like who, who talks when uh, on that medium, right? If you don't have that, then you might want to opt for a CSMA protocol, right? So this, this is like, you know, the master-slave thing. That's, I just put that up there as an example. If you want this to be totally like everyone's equal and stuff, and they all have equal rights to the medium, but they want to avoid collision, you would use exactly CD, uh, CSMA, just what, what we did. So for instance, let's say we get, so that's a great point. So let's, let's look at that flip side. So let's say we go back to bus part two. But that's a great point. So let's say all of them are equal. Equal, and therefore, eh, therefore we have a contention-based, contention-based network. Right? Which we just saw in quiz number seven. Oh, wow. So what happens is you've got bus, node, 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 right? And what ends up happening is, is the channel available? Is anyone transmitting? Oh, it is? OK, I'm going to get onto it. And then send your traffic to whoever. Could be on the network, or it could go off the network to another network via the internet, right? That big cloud, you know? What happens is, while it's occupied, all the other guys, if anyone wants to transmit on it, it's like, is the channel in use? Oh, yeah, 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 and backs off. That's where that CSMA kicks in, right? So that's a great, that's a great point, Thomas. So you can either have master-slave configuration, in which case there is someone centralized saying, your turn, your turn, your turn, your turn, or it's like, if you want something a little less inefficient, it's like, oh, you're using it? Oh, OK, OK. Oh, you're using it? OK. Oh, it's free? Right? Just like TV at home if you have multiple siblings, right? And you don't have the arguments either. So, I have two sisters, so. Uh, so anyways, star topology. Very different. So where do star topology show up other than in, say, uh, networks? Urban planning. Think about it. The transportation network the, in Boston, the MBTA. The commuter rail. Like, do you see any trains going from Worcester to Fitchburg directly? No. How do you get to Fitchburg from Worcester doing only commuter rail? You go all the way into South Station. You run across downtown Boston. You go to North Station. Then you go all the way to Fitchburg, right? Oh, now I want to go to Providence from Fitchburg. Go all the way to North Station, cross downtown, uh, get to South Station, go all the way down to Providence, maybe the airport, right? What happens is the star topology, everything is centralized at one location, right? So what you would have is you have one guy, and everything goes to that one guy, right? And it looks like a star. Like, seriously, look at the, uh, the uh, commuter rail map. And what you're going to see is, Everything goes to Boston. It's not perfectly a star because you've got North Station, you've got South Station. They didn't really make the bridge, did they? So, but what ends up happening is everything, is everything reaches a specific vertex and then emanates from a specific vertex. Every, and so what happens is 
it's nice in some way because this type of network is also scalable, right? So bus topology is scalable because if I have suddenly a new node that I want to add, I just add them to the bus. If I have, let's say, a new computer to add to the star, yet another node goes there. Bad thing is, if let's say I want to go from A to C, the only way to do it is like this and like this. So it's like, you know, even though these two guys might be next to each other, the only way to connect them is to route them through that center guy, that B. And that B could be a switch. All right? So there are two, t there's, yes? Could there an issue with traffic jams, so to speak, at the switch? Ah, yes. That's a perfect question. So what happens is this guy here, this switch, has to play several roles. So that's exactly the point. Like, first of all, let's say the switch does not have enough jacks. Like, that's the case right now at home with me. So what, what I did, so, OK, I know, this, I digress. But I really want to bring up, because you brought up an excellent point, because now I have to spend more money. Because what happens is, in, in my 2020 hindsight, I should have gotten an eight port switch for my basement. Right now, I have cable modem. It goes into my router, wireless and wired. I brought down a wire into my basement. And then I said, OK, my living room has a Roku. I want to use a wired connection. My wife's office needs a wired connection. I want to bring a line up into my office. So it has to go all the way to the attic and then drop down. And oh, my backup server's there. So I just need four jacks in my switch. And then the fifth one is where the Ethernet is coming from and two from the uh, cable modem, right? Oh, but now I want to put, let's say, a home entertainment thing in my, you know, the basement, because it's kind of like a family room once it's renovated. Now I have to buy a completely new switch. Or I daisy chain. So daisy chains are, let's say I take one uh, port, uh, one port from the switch, and then connect another four port switch to that. So does it, just in case people don't know what a daisy chain is, Oh, I, first of all, I think it's a really cool name. So what happens is, if you ever pick flowers, and I know we all do, right? So what happens is, suppose you have a flower. So daisy chain, let's say you loop it around, you do something, and then, hey, I'm going to connect another flower to it. So let's say I do this, and then flower. Oh, then I'm going to do this. So you just basically, this endless connection, uh, linking, if you will, of flower after flower after flower after flower. What you can do with Ethernet is you can do what I'm doing at home, but I'm not sure if it's the most optimal. What you can do is, let's say that is from Charter and to Charter, right? So that's the internet at the Wiglinski household. Now, so that's cable modem. Then it goes to my wireless and wired, OK? Whoa. I should spell, um, router, switch. I think it's a switch in this case. Then what happens is there's a bunch of jacks. Some of them are very local. So there's a printer. There's a scanner. Um, there's a computer there in the mudroom. And then one guy goes to the basement, to basement. Now, in the basement, I have yet another switch. And it's not supervised. I don't need a computer. I, all it's going to do. And this, actually, I'm really cutting ahead to the end of this lecture. What it has, so first of all, this switch here, OK? This switch has something called a forwarding table. Oh, that sounds nice. Forwarding table. And the forwarding table will have IP address. So it's the network address, the network ID of every device. And it's going to have associated with it a port number, not a, uh, no, let me change it, jack number, the physical number of the jack. So I have one, two, three, four. So that's printer, and it has an IP address as well. Uh, scanner, it has an IP address as well. Um, family computer, whatever you want to call it, okay? So let's say call it computer number one. And so printer, so let's say I get internet, or let's say I have a request from computer number one to print something. So computer number one will say, OK, uh, I need to send this information to IP address 192.168.14. I'm not sure if that actually is. 
That's 192, 168, 1, 5. 192, 168, 1, 3. So what happens is the print utility says, oh, so Wiglinski dot printer, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So what happens is there's so, uh, like, you know, when the print setup, computer number one will, will send something to the switch. It will contain information and it says, this is intended for 192, 168, 14. And there is a service, an application. Remember many lectures ago with the protocol architecture? There is an application in the application layer that it says, if I receive this information on this port, it means that it's a print job. And I will spool it, and I will print it out in a physical paper form. What happens is the switch says, you got this IP address? No problem. Jack 1. And it sends the information automatically to Jack 1, really fast, rickety split. Right? What ends up happening is that this line, this jack number four, this connection number four, goes to the basement. And then there are four more. Sorry, two, three, four. So one goes to the Roku. One goes to, um, you know, let's say computer number two. That's, let's say, my wife's computer, number two. One goes to, uh, what is it? Backup server which I need to upgrade. And one goes to AW's computer upstairs. Okay? And so what happens is, again, this is going to have a forwarding table. So what ends up happening is the way Ethernet works is you have this standard, you have these IP addresses, you have these different architectures like bus, like star topologies. You have forwarding tables that quickly if you say, this is the IP address, oh yeah, I know where to send it, and sends it onto that jack. So let's say, the uh, fourth jack, so let's say, um, scanner, like, suppose I set it up with some fancy software that automatically sends it to a computer and network. In fact, it does have that configuration. But I, instead, I just, by default, send it to computer number one. But suppose I want to send it to AW computer. So scanner will then send it and say, this is intended for 192. 168, 1, 8. And what's going to happen is, in this case, it's a little tricky because now what it says is it goes to the switch and says, oh, holy smokes, yes. Oh, so I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no, no. I just see like your hand going up very intently. Um, so is the, that's a, the first one is a wireless router and the second one is a switch? Like oh, it could be wireless or a wired. So in this case, everything I'm describing is wired. Okay. Just to keep things simple. I think, oh, okay. like right now, like everything I'm showing is, it, assume that it's wired. Okay. Wireless, then it's a little bit of a different story because now you have wireless Ethernet. Right. This is assuming wired Ethernet in this case. Okay. If it's wireless, then, well, first of all, the topology obviously will be, it will be a little different because it's a star. You're commu communicating to the same the switch, right, the hub. But at the same time, you have a common medium, and then that's where the medium access protocols kick in. So we'll be talking a little bit more about Wi-Fi next week. OK. So <laughs> I'm sorry. So what, what happens is the, the, that information gets forwarded. It then goes here. There's another forwarding table. And it says, oh, yeah, you want Wiglinski's computer and send it that way. So what the, for, the job of the forwarding table is to quickly forward information from point A to point B through this switch. Okay, so that's what a switch is. So we'll keep that just in case. All right. Ooh. So start topology, and there's no collision. But there are other issues, as was mentioned. Like what happens is, just like what I mentioned, suppose you don't have enough jacks on your switch to support all the devices you want to connect to it. So what do you do? That daisy chain, right? So let's say right now the issue I have at home. So I'm not sure why I'm telling you about all these things at home. But let, anyways, so let's suppose I want, to have a, I want to expand my wired network at home. And I can do that. And let's say I want to be cheap and just daisy chain. What I can do is, first of all, let's say I disconnect the backup connection. And I take jack 3, 
and then I connect it to yet another switch. And I have four outputs. One now goes to, let's say, a fourth jack to the backup server. And then the other three go elsewhere in the house. So this is what's meant by daisy chaining. What happens is you take, or daisy chain, you have one switch, and then you take one of the connections connected to the next switch. Oh, I need more jacks connected to the next switch, and the next switch, and the next switch. I, some cases, I'm trying to think, what are the limitations? There is definitely a distance limitation, how long your Ethernet cable can be, right? But I, I think it's like on the order of like a few hundred feet, so not to worry. Um, the other thing is, is like regarding the number of daisy, amount of daisy chaining that you can perform. Like, hmm? Yes, because what happens is switches have a non, so latency will definitely go up because switches have a non negligible amount of latency. Like, you know, it takes the time to say, oh, forward, oh, I got it, forward. You know, every time you do that, it's like playing football, right? So you can either do the long bomb and you get a touchdown or pass, okay, pass, okay, pass. Actually, I'm not much of a football fan. Ultimate Frisbee, <laughs> ultimate Frisbee, right? So you can do the long, like I know friends, they can like launch that thing and goes on the other side and someone catches it, okay, point, and back and forth, right? Or there's the, you know, slow approach, but very safe, short pass, short passes. But then the game takes forever, you know, to score a point, right? So excellent, excellent, Thomas. Woo! I just want to play ultimate right now. It's almost like the weather for it. So, moving right along. So what happens is your NIC, your network interface card, encapsulate your IP datagram. That's the data. It, it wraps it in a, what we call an Ethernet frame. This is at the link layer. And what it consists of is a preamble of eight bytes, of which seven are 10101010 one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, followed by one byte uh, with the pattern 10101011. One, uh, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. And so what this does, okay, this, what this guy does is it wakes up the NIC. It says, hey, I'm about to send something. And, and synchronizes the clock rate. So that's why we have this alternating 10101010. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. It's kind of like, okay, here's this alternating pattern, okay? Let's synchronize to this clock, this pattern. Okay, one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero. Now, the arrival of the one one says, okay, enough synchronizing. The next thing is going to be the MAC address, right? So that's the trigger. After all those alternating ones and zeros, when it's one one, okay, stop synchronizing. The next bit of information is going to be the MAC address, right? The hardware address of your device. And so the six bytes are source and destination MAC. Then the type, what type of protocol are we doing? Are we doing ARP? Is it like, you know, sharing IP and MAC addresses with everyone in the network? Or is it actual data? We have the CRC again. We're trying to check if there's any corruption. And then last but not least, 1,500 bytes of data. You know, how does this all look? Well, let's see. Get rid of these scribbles and replace it with other scribbles. So what you've got, Eight bytes, six bytes, six bytes, ah, two bytes, and then 1,500 bytes. So you got the one zero one zero one zero, then oh, sorry, one the you know, and then the last one with one one. You got the MAC address, right? And then you have the type, the CRC check, and then the data. So this last one is the biggie. But all this, this is a header. This is what we use, the, 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 the uh, Ethernet frame, to do everything from end to end. Synchronize with the NIC, the network interface card, provide the MAC address, indicate the type of data, indicate the CRC check, and then the data itself. All of that in one package deal, your Ethernet frame. Okay? And so, what ends up happening, so that's the drawing. And then what happens is this is always in broadcast mode. It's connectionless. So there's no handshaking. You just fire off frames everywhere. And you have a protocol. Again, that's CSMA CD. I wonder where we learned that. Okay. And then the Ethernet switch I just talked about. 
And what that does is that forwarding, which we've just described before. And so this allows for multiple transmissions at any given time. The one thing I did not talk about about the switch, and again answers the other part about, is this feasible if you have lots of people talking to it, it buffers information. So if it gets too much, it says, okay, I'm going to store this in memory, and then the next possible chance I deliver it onwards. Okay, so with that, that is lecture 15, folks. Woo! <laughs> now, now what I need to do is sell.